Hello everyone, in this video um, we're going to be going through some particle model revision. So if you're just watching this uh, as just a straight video then feel free to just watch all the way through and you should just go through some stuff and hopefully you can pick up some things. If you, if either I or your uh, other physics teacher has given you a little booklet to go through this, you probably want to be pausing it after each section, um, that's why the booklet's split up into sections and once you've seen something try and have a go at the question relating to it so uh, it should be quite clear like when I go through this first section then you can stop and then do the diagrams and things like that okay um, so I'll get started straight away so we're going to start off looking at uh, solids liquids and gases and what happens as we change states between them so when we're drawing these um, if you want to have a go at this I would have a go at this before if you're going to do this yourself and then see if you get it right. So if you have had a go yourself, then this, now I'm going to uh, go through it for you. When we're drawing a solid, a liquid and a gas, we want to draw our particles. First off, you want to draw them nice and big. A lot of people make the mistake of drawing your particles really small like this and then you spend absolutely ages trying to fill it in. And it starts to look a little bit messy as well because you've got some particles that are slightly bigger than others. Don't do that. Okay, rub that out. You're better off when you're drawing these, especially in an exam, drawing your particles quite big, okay, so that you've not got to do that many particles. So nice and big, okay, trying to get them as close to the same size as possible. And I'm terrible at drawing, um, but I'm managing to get them all in a nice neat row in order. And that's what's important when I'm drawing a solid. And I want to be filling up as much of my box as I possibly can as well okay with this so my solid there we go so things we need to notice with this one I've got them in rows and I've got them in a pattern and I've got no gaps okay um, now I'm going to skip on now to looking at the gas. <coughs> Most, <coughs> sorry, mostly because liquids are the ones that people tend to get wrong. So we'll go through that one last. So in a gas, you just want to draw a few particles, and you want to draw them spread out. Now again, I'll go through what mistakes might be made with this. What mistakes might be made is when people do something like this. Okay. Now they draw them spread out, but that's in a pattern, and that's not what you want. So what we want to do is draw randomly spaced out particles, just a few of them, okay? So we've got them, they are random, and we've got, in between them, we've got gaps, okay, big gaps in between them. So randomly spaced out with big gaps in between. So that's our gas, and I think the gas is probably the easiest one to draw. Now liquid's the hardest one. Now um, sometimes I see people doing it where you've got gaps in between them all and it's something like this, okay, and that's not what we want because that is actually what a gas would be, okay. Um, and sometimes I see, see this funny thing where people are drawing something like this, okay, like a little chain of particles going off and they're all touching but they're like this. Now imagine if that was a glass of water and you had your water starting off at one point in the bottom and stretching up through your glass and not touching the sides or anything like that and that's not right either. Okay. So what you actually want to draw for a liquid is kind of similar to a solid. You want to have all the particles touching and you do want some little gaps in there but you don't want many. Okay. You just want a few gaps in between some of the particles and you want to fill up from the bottom okay and fill up to the top as much as you can so something like this so we've got very small gaps but we've got all of the particles are touching and as well, we're making sure that the pattern is random. Okay, so we've got a random pattern in between them. 
Right, now we're going to have a quick look at what we could say when we're turning from a solid to a liquid to a gas and backwards. Okay, so if we've got a solid turning into a liquid, okay, we should know what we call this because we call this melting. Okay, so think about you've got ice in the freezer, take it out, okay, it melts. If we carry on with that and we heat that liquid up, eventually it will turn into a gas and it will evaporate. So I'll call that evaporating. Going the other way, okay, if we turn a gas into a liquid, if you think about what you get when you have water vapour onto a window, that's condensation because it is condensing. And a liquid turns into a solid, you put water in the freezer, that is freezing. So, the way I like to think of these is think about what water does, because you know, everyone knows what happens when you take an ice cube out of the freezer, it melts, so it's melting. You know that you have a puddle of water or, um, outside, it will evaporate eventually, it will disappear. Condensation is what you get on the window, and freezing is what happens when you put something in the freezer, freezer freezing, obviously. Okay, so if you think about water, think about water, that will help you to understand what uh, these are are doing. Now the ones that you might not have remembered are the ones where it's skipping out the liquid altogether. So this is things like carbon dioxide that does this. So very few things do this, one of them is being carbon dioxide. Okay. And we call this sublimation. Okay. So carbon dioxide doesn't melt, it sublimates. It goes straight from a solid into a gas without being a liquid. And if we go in the other way, we call it deposition. So that's when you turn a gas into a solid without becoming a liquid again. Okay, so next question, what we're gonna look at. So this is a sort of exam question you quite often get on uh, solids, liquids and gases. And it is a comparison question. So that's the most important thing we need to notice first. The keyword that we've got at the start, our command word is compare. So it says compare the particles in a gas and a solid. Okay, so the first things I'm gonna highlight after my uh, command word. In terms of arrangement, movement and forces. So, when we're looking at questions like this, first off we want to think what, we, what it's asking us to do. So it's asking us to compare. So it wants us to talk about two different things and say how they are different. Okay, um, so for a gas and a solid. So that means we don't talk about liquids. The amount of times as, as marking papers I've seen people get a question like this and start talking about liquids, which I don't think you'd lose many marks for, but you definitely wouldn't gain any marks and you probably not going to have even space or time to write the rest of the stuff that you need to. And then it's asking about arrangement, movement and forces. Now it might not be set out as simple as this in an exam question. You probably have to dig into the question a little bit more, but you're looking for these sort of keywords that it wants you to describe things about. Okay, so when I get a question like this, what I would do is I would plan my answer. So put this page on at the same time as this one. I would try and box up my answer. And by that I mean I would do a little plan. So I'd start trying to make a plan of what I'm going to talk about. So I think about what are my key points. So my key points that the answer is talking me to, to uh, sorry, my question is asking me to discuss are these three things I've highlighted in blue at the bottom. So my arrangement. Nope. Uh, the movement and the forces. So what I need to include for that are talking about a gas and a solid. Again, as it says in the question. So I'm just doing what it tells me to do in the question here. And this is going to help me focus my mind on what I need to do. Now, this is going to take me a little bit of time because I'm going to go through showing you how to do it. But in an exam, this little plan should take you a couple of seconds and you wouldn't need to write this so anyone could read it. You just write it up in the corner somewhere. You might even not even write full words. OK, so write arrange, move, force. OK, and then just G and S for each of these. So you're just doing it really quickly just to focus your mind on what you need to write. So we're trying to minimise how much we're writing for the actual answer 
and maximize marks. So we're minimizing how much we're writing and maximizing marks. So when an examiner looks at it, they're seeing, right, he's talking, because they're going to look for the points that you're making. Are they talking about arrangement in gases and solids? Okay, if you plan it, then you're going to do that much, much more concisely. So if we're talking about arrangement in a gas, okay, we just looked at the pictures before. And gases we know have random arrangement, okay, they have big gaps, okay, um, things like that you want to be talking about. Whereas solids are in a pattern, uh, no gaps, Ooh. you might say they are regular. So these, I'm just putting keywords in here that I'm going to try and use in my answer. Again, this is just a plan. So movement, gases, it's random, uh, they move freely, uh, they move quickly, whereas solids um, don't move because they're so tightly packed together, but they just vibrate. Right, forces. So this is just a, a straight up comparison. So you'd say what the force is like in a gas, they are very weak. Whereas solids have strong forces holding them together. So when you go into your answer now, I'm not going to write the full answer out. Okay. Um, when This should now be easy to go into your answer. So you'd start off by saying gases are arranged in a random pattern with big gaps in between them. Okay. And then you say, a comp then you are comparing. So you've got to have a comparison word in there. However, solids are arranged in a regular pattern with no gaps in between them. Then you move on to your next sentence. Maybe you put it as a new paragraph. Again, show the examiner. I now am talking about movement. Gases move randomly, very uh, freely and very quickly. Uh, and I'll use a different comparison word. On the other hand, solids cannot move and they just vibrate. So they cannot move freely, so they just vibrate around a fixed position. And then final paragraph, forces. Um, gases have very weak forces in between the particles, whereas solids have very strong forces holding them together. So I've got my six marks there quite easily without writing too much, and that wouldn't take me long to write. And it's, this is because I've planned it beforehand. So if you've got your book, if you've obviously if you're just watching this, just watch it. If you've got your booklet now, you should have a slightly different question to answer. So none of the questions on your booklet are the same as these. Um, so again, do the same thing. So plan it and then write your answer and you make it as short as possible. So you're giving yourself as little work to do as you possibly can. Right, so moving on to the second section now, and we're looking at internal energy and temperature, but mainly really internal energy. Now, this is a really, really important sort of key term that we need to learn. Uh, we need to understand what it is, we need to understand how it affects things, and examiners love it when you talk about internal energy for some reason. Um, whenever you look on exam mark schemes, they, like, the word internal energy seems to crop up a lot. So if you can manage to use it in context and use it properly, they're going to like it. Now temperature is a slightly confusing um, term in some ways, because the way you use it in real life, normal life, is not wrong by any stretch of the imagination, it's a perfectly good way. So you might say temperature is how hot something is, which is fine, but it's not the scientific definition for temperature. So we need to know what that is as well. So this is what we're looking into now, okay? So we want to know what is temperature and what is uh, internal energy. So internal energy is a total kinetic and potential energy within a system. So it's a total energy inside a system. Now a system as well, being an important term, meaning just the object you are looking at, the thing you're looking at. So, when talking about the total kinetic energy, we are kind of talking about the temperature as well, because it is the average kinetic energy. That's what temperature is. So temperature is the average kinetic energy per particle. So if you take all the particles in a system, so let's just say, for example, we've got a few particles in a system. Okay, so we've got a little liquid here. Okay, and we say they've got certain amounts of kinetic energy. So we've got one that's got two joules, one that's got one, one that's got three, one that's got four, uh, one that's got uh, another one that's got three. Okay, if we add those all up, so one, add two, so three, six, nine, 
uh, add 4 is 13 and divide that by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That would give us our total kinetic energy. Okay, Aver sorry, average kinetic energy and therefore our temperature. Okay, so let's get rid of that. This is the average kinetic energy of the particles in a system. And the potential energy is the bonds between the atoms. So that's either, and that includes two things actually, that includes the forces holding them together and the bonds between atoms. So the uh, so the chemical bonds. So the physical forces and the chemical bonds. What I mean by that, the physical forces is like the things holding a solid together. So the forces between particles in an ice, in ice or metal, or whatever. And chemical bonds being like chemical bonds between, like say, in water, the like H O H. So this here is your chemical bond, and the bond between that and the next water particle that there this bond here is your physical force okay so those two bonds added together mean your potential energy right moving on from that then so we'll look a little bit more at temperature and energy now and comparing them so internal energy constantly goes up as you heat something so say we take some ice out of the freezer it's at 20 degrees we heat it up well, we don't even need to heat it, we'll just leave it out on the side. And because it's 20, because it's positive 20 degrees in the room, or something like that, room temperature, the ice would get warmer, okay? It would heat up to zero degrees. And all that would happen is that the particles would start to vibrate a little bit more, okay? So our particles in our ice would start to vibrate more. The amount of kinetic energy would go up. So between here and here, we are increasing... kinetic energy or the average kinetic energy which therefore we're increasing the temperature now between ice turning into water though the temperature doesn't change okay so instead of but we've we're still increasing the internal energy though so between ice and water we're still increasing the internal energy so if the temperature is not changing, what is the energy being used for? So between here and here, the energy is used to break bonds. So energy used to break the bonds. Okay, so we're using the energy not to increase the kinetic energy anymore, because it doesn't get any hotter, we can see that, okay, by the fact that the temperatures have just stayed the same so it's zero and zero we are using the energy to break the bonds between the atoms the internal energy is still going up because it's still sat on the side it's still hotter it would still go up after it's got turned into water and go up to 20 degrees okay but the energy is not being used to break the bonds anymore it's been sorry energy is not being used to increase the kinetic energy it's used to break the bonds instead so Moving on to the next bit, thinking about this, which of these has a higher temperature and which has more energy? So it's thinking about the difference between internal energy and temperature. And it's pretty obvious that the fire has the highest temperature. We know that. And the iceberg has a lower temperature of a fire and an iceberg. And the fire has a much higher temperature because every particle in that fire is going to have lots of energy. It's going to have a very high average kinetic energy. But the iceberg actually has more energy in total. And that is because the iceberg has more mass. OK, so the fire has a higher temperature because it's got a higher average uh, kinetic energy. I'm just going to put EK for kinetic energy. But the iceberg has more energy total because it's got more mass okay so more particles so it's got more particles overall so even if every particle's only got a tiny amount of energy because there's so many of them okay 
if you add them all up, the total energy, the total internal energy is going to be higher. So uh, again, if you're on your booklet now, you've got some very similar questions to the ones I've just kind of gone through here. So if you want to go at those, if not, just keep watching and we'll move on to the next section. Okay, our next little section is about specific latent heat. Um, so this is, and the definition that you need for this, is the energy needed to change the state of one kilogram of a substance. And that's really important, that one kilogram. Now, when we're talking about this, it can either be the specific latent heat of vaporization or the specific latent heat of fusion. Okay, so specific latent heat of vaporization or fusion. And depending on which one of these it is, depends on what you'd write for your definition. Because if you're asked for the specific latent heat of vaporization, what you would do is you'd write this bit out, and then you'd say, when changing from a solid, sorry, gas to liquid, or liquid to gas. Okay, and if it's fusion, it's going to be liquid to solid, or solid to liquid. So, all you need to do, if you're asked for specific latent heat of vaporization, you write, specific latent heat of vaporization is the energy needed to change the state of one kilogram of a substance from a liquid to gas if it's vaporization, and liquid to solid if it says fusion. So you just add these bits on the end, depending on what you need. Um, now, the equation that we've got which links these together is energy equals mass times specific latent heat. Now, this is on your equation sheet, luckily, so it's not one that you need to know. Um, and it is, yeah, so it's on your equation sheet and it's used for um, just a quite a simple equation, really. So I'm not going to go through this on the video. There is an example for you to have a go at if you have got the little booklet, though. So have a go at that example. Now, the only thing where this becomes quite difficult is it's quite often using standard form, um, but that's something that I'll have gone through in a separate thing. Right. So the reason I've put this graph on here is that the specific latent heat is in this bit here. So if we refer back to what we were just talking about um, a few slides back with this, the specific latent heat is this bit here. It is the energy needed to break the bonds. That is the specific latent heat, or is that it, or that is the latent heat, the energy needed to break the bonds. Now, specific latent heat means it's the energy needed to break the bonds in one kilogram or something. Uh, but either way, it describes what is going on at this part of this graph just here, okay, when it goes flat. And this is telling us that something is, in this case, it's cooling down, okay. It started hot, it cooled down, but then it stops. And when it stops, it's losing internal energy at a constant rate because it's cooling down, okay. But it stops going down in temperature because at this point here, okay, it is changing state. So at this point here, our substance is changing. Oh, sorry about that. Pen's not working very well. So at this point here, sorry, that is changing state. So there it's changing state, and if we look at a different part, say this top part here, that is where the object is cooling down, okay? Because this is a cooling curve. If it was the opposite way around, so here, it's cooling, okay? And which means the temperature is decreasing. So it's cooling down, the temperature is decreasing there, and it cools down again once it has changed state. But the energy is being used for different things here. So when it's cooling down, we are getting a lower kinetic energy. So the average kinetic energy is lowering. But this bit here, when it's changing state, the energy is being used to form bonds. Okay, so when we're asked about what is happening in these graphs, it might say, um, so sometimes you might get 
like labels on it. So it might just have like A here, uh, B here, C there, and D at the bottom there. So you might say, what is happening between A and B? And you'd say, the object is cooling, so the temperature is decreasing, which means the average kinetic energy is getting lower. And you'd ask what's happening between B and C. And you'd say, the object is changing state, okay? And the temperature is staying the same, and the energy is used to form bonds between the particles. Now, sometimes you will also get this graph the opposite way round, okay? So you just get, I'll just quickly draw it up at the side here. So you might get something um, with the same labels up the side, but it might be heating up and it'll go up, and then it'll level off and then go up again. So that would be the same thing, but instead of saying it's cooling down, the temperature's decreasing, you say down here, okay, the temperature's increasing and it's heating up and it's not forming bonds in the middle, it's breaking the bonds. Um, now you might be able to say a specific change of state. So if I knew it was liquid up here and solid down here, I might say it's freezing. But I don't know that necessarily. Okay, so you just say it's changing state if you don't know. If you do know, obviously, then do say it. Um, so that's this is all linked with our specific latent heat because this is this bit here is the important bit. That's the difficult bit where it's forming the bonds and that's the latent heat. Okay, the energy is being used to form the bonds, or in this case over here it's been used to break the bonds. Right, moving on to the next section, talking about specific heat capacity. So this is kind of similar, um, the definition looks quite similar to specific latent heat, but do not get them confused because they're totally different things. Specific heat capacity is the energy when the thing's being heated up. So if we go back to what we were just looking at, um, specific heat capacity is the energy used when it's getting heated up down here as opposed to the energy that's being used to form the bonds or break the bonds. So <coughs> what specific heat capacity actually is, is the energy needed to heat up one kilogram by one degree C. And that is told by the word specific. So specific, specific means, not specific, specific means that you've got a specific amount of mass and in this case a specific temperature rise. So how much energy we need to heat up one kilogram of something by one degrees Celsius? And the equation is again on the equation sheet, but we do obviously need to know it, otherwise we're just going to get into exam and not understand what it is. So the change in thermal energy equals mass times specific heat capacity times the temperature change. So you're obviously going to get calculation questions for this, okay? There is a um, compulsory practical which you need to know. I'm not going to go through that today. I'm not going to go through any of the compulsory practicals in this section, um, but I will put uh, some links to some extra different videos, not from me, going through uh, how you would do that compulsory practical, which is definitely worth having a look at, okay? Because that's really important, but we will revise that separately. Um, so if you want to think about specific heat capacity, you've got to think about what sort of things would we want to have a high specific heat capacity and what sort of things would we want to have a low specific heat capacity. And it's basically looking at this equation and thinking, right, if the specific heat capacity goes up, what happens to the energy? So let's say our specific heat capacity is very high. That's going to mean we've got a very high thermal energy. So if we've got a certain mass that we can have and a certain temperature change that we can have, if we have a high specific heat capacity, we're going to get lots of energy stored inside something. So for example, in a radiator or a storage heater, the bricks inside the storage heater or the water inside your radiator, you want these to have a high specific heat capacity. And that's so they can store lots of energy. So in a storage heater, you'd heat up the bricks, they'd store the energy, and then they'd give that out slowly over time. And the higher your specific heat capacity, the more thermal energy you are able to store inside of those bricks. Now with a pan, what you're worried about is the temperature change. You want that to be as quick as possible. But again, it's going to be a fixed amount. It's going to get to a certain temperature, which is the right temperature to cook your beans or your sausages or your bacon or whatever you're cooking in your pan. So, 
and the mass is obviously going to be pretty similar as well because it's going to be such it's going to be so big okay your frying pan is going to be a certain size and a certain mass okay so you want your specific heat capacity to be as low as possible so that it takes less energy and it's quicker to heat up so you want your frying pan to have a low specific heat capacity so when you're looking at questions like this when you're given a question like this it could be any object okay it could be any object in the world and that's been used for something to do with heat okay and they're going to ask you do you want it to have a low or a high specific heat capacity so if it's something you want to have a high specific heat capacity it's to store lots of thermal energy okay to keep it in there for a long time or to heat up something else or whatever you need to do if you want something that's going to heat up quickly though you want a low specific heat capacity so it takes less energy and therefore less time to heat up right i'm going to move on to our last section now which is density so our definition for density is that density is the mass in a certain volume which is very similar to our equation which is density is mass divided by volume and it's actually one of those uh, definitions where the definition is the same as the equation basically just put into words so if you just put the equation into words you're going to get uh, told what density is now density tells us lots of things though it's also kind of to do with how compact the particles are and it will tell us if things will sink or if things will float so for example if you have a uh, beaker okay so just draw a quick beaker and we fill it with water now if you put something on top of it okay if it is less dense than the water it will float so this thing on the top is going to be less dense than the water but if we put something else in there and it sinks to the bottom then this thing is going to be more dense than the water so things that are less dense than water tend to float and things that are more dense tend to sink um, and that's the first thing we can look at with density okay it's just is something going to float or is it going to sink and the le least dense things will always float to the top and the most dense things will always sink to the bottom um, now this links in a little bit with well quite a lot with the compulsory practical for density again i'm not going to go through the compulsory practicals today okay um, i'm going to put a link to separate videos if you need them um, and then you'll be able to look that up yourselves uh, but this video is more about the um, context behind some of those so last thing i'm going to look at with this is using the equation though because this is not as simple an equation as it looks it just looks like a three-part equation mass divided by volume but the problem is the volume okay it's quite often quite hard to work out so if you're lucky you just get given a volume and a mass and you just divide them and work it out but in this case here we're given three lengths of a cuboid now density is measured in either grams per centimeter cubed or kilograms per meter cubed now we've got grams and centimeters which is good because then we can just leave those as that and put them in grams per centimeter cubed if you've got kilograms and meters that's fine as well but if you've got a mixture of those say if i had say if this was in uh kilograms not grams i would have to convert either my centimeters or my grams uh, sorry kilograms into grams now i would always advise if you get if you've got the option to convert the mass if you can choose which one you do if not it might tell you you have to convert one and therefore you convert the centimeters before you times them all together it'll make it a lot easier for you right so let's have a go at this and so first off we need to find the volume so volume of a cuboid okay is I thought that was uh, length times width times height okay so we're going to do length times width times height so the volume is going to be uh, 5 times 4 times 10 centimeters okay so my volume equals 5 times 4 is 20 times 10 is 200 centimeters cubed okay 
So I've got a volume of 200 centimeters cubed. Now from that, I can also, I've also got the mass already, it's 500 grams, and I've got my equation, density is mass divided by volume. So all I need to do is mass of 500 grams divided by my volume of 200 centimeters cubed. Let's pop that underneath, okay? And that will give us an answer of, so we type, divide those by each other. So 500 divided by 200 is 2.5 grams per centimeter cubed, okay? So I'm answering. Okay, so 2.5 grams per centimeter cubed. Right, so this is how you work these out. Like I said, you just have to be really careful with your units, make sure you've got the right ones. So because I did grams divided by centimeters cubed, that's gonna work out like that. Um, so there will be another example if you've got the sheet to have a go at with this, and um, that should be most of the things you need to do for density. Um, so that's it for this section in this video. So hopefully, um, you managed to remember a few things that you've done before because it should be used as revision um, and hopefully if you've got the little booklets that go with this you've been able to fill in most of the questions obviously feel free to email me or any of your your actual physics teacher if you've got any questions about any of this and i'm sure they'll be able to help you